December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the Japanese sent 350 planes off of six aircraft carriers due west of Pearl Harbor to attack the naval base, the American naval base. And what did they find when they got there? They found sitting ducks, and they utterly destroyed the American fleet. Four first-line battleships, four more first-line battleships were uh, damaged, four were destroyed, four of them were damaged. And in the process of all this, you have to ask the question, how does this happen? How is it that this amazing military might of the U.S. Uh, Army and Navy can be utterly destroyed? We lost 2,400 men. The Japanese lost 64 2,400 to 64. What is it that gets you there? I think there's a couple components. One of them is that they were utterly surprised. The Americans were not ready in any way. In fact, when they looked at the radar screen, they saw the blip on the screen that said there's a massive amount of planes coming in. They looked at the data. They looked at their log. What's, what's supposed to happen? And ironically, just perfect timing, there was a, a squadron of B-17s that were coming in from the mainland, and the person that saw it on the radar said, no big deal, let them go. 350 Japanese planes coming in with no warning. The other reason the Americans were so surprised is because the Japanese and the Americans were sitting down to peace talks, which was a deception. The Americans were deceived. 2,400 to 64. What do we do in battle, and how do we fight our battles? Today, we're going to be looking at how we fight spiritual battles, and we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 10. Turn with me there if you haven't already. I want us to walk through what does it look like to be ready so there's no surprise attack, that when Satan comes at you, you are ready. Now, this is the end of the book. We've spent, throughout this year, we did a sermon series on, on chapters 1, 2, and 3, and we're finishing up chapters 4, 5, and 6, where we are looking at what it means to live out what God has called us to. And at the very end of it all, he says, finally, this is where he starts on, in verse 10, finally, this is what you need to know. Battle's coming, and here's how you're going to fight it. So he says this in, in verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground against the devil's schemes. I don't know if you catch this. He says so much about how to fight a battle right here. In these first two verses, he's giving the intro, and he says three actions. And I think whenever you're thinking about battle, you really want to know, what did they do? What is it you're supposed to do? For instance, what did the Japanese do? They launched their planes. What did the Americans not do? Launch their planes. Okay, you, see, you see the component here? What do you do in battle? And he says some things here that I think are so profound, and I want your heart to cap be captured by them. The first thing that he says is we need to know what the effective actions are. The first one he says is he says to be strong. In verse 10, he doesn't tell you to go anywhere. He says, be strong in the Lord. And it's key here that you catch this. It's in the Lord. If you are going to be strong on your own, let me tell you, I don't care how much weight you can pump. I don't care how great your diet is. You won't win in this battle if you are strong on your own. Because being strong is only strong if it's strong in the Lord. The second thing that he says is he says to put on. He says, make sure, hey, we got some armor for you. You've got to gear up for this. You have to make sure that you have what you need ready and able to put on. Next thing that you'll see is be strong and then put on. And then an interesting one here is he says, stand. Okay? The interesting thing about this, he actually says it three times. He says, stand firm. And then he says, put it on. And once you've done everything to stand, Stand. He says, this is so critical. You have to stand your ground. As I was talking with a friend of mine about the idea of standing, he was saying, whenever you're in, in any type of combat, um, mixed martial arts, any type of, of, of combat, this is also true in sports, footwork is everything. If you can simply get someone off balance a little, you've got them. Let me tell you something. Just so, this is a little side note. This is what Satan would love to do. If he can get you off balance, he has a great opportunity to take you out. But as I look at these three things, and I'm thinking about battle, you know what I always think about battle? And partly this is because I'm kind of an aggressive person, is where's the hill? Let's take the hill. Let's attack the enemy. Let's charge the gates. Let's get them. 
be strong, put on, and stand. There's no charge. And I was thinking about this, and, and I'm going to infer this, that the text doesn't say this, but as I was looking at this, and I was studying this, and, and, and as I was processing this, one of the things I realized, I was thinking about everything we studied in chapters 1, 2, and 3. What, did it, what is it that we said there? We defined who we are. Anytime you're in a battle, you know where you have to be if you want to win? I mean, it's critical. You need the high ground. And as I thought about this, the reason you don't charge is when you already have the high ground. And do we have the high ground? Yeah, let, let me tell you a little bit about myself. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to tell you a little bit about you. I am chosen by God. I am holy and I am blameless. I am adopted and I've been renamed and I am sealed until the day of redemption. Let me tell you a little bit about you. You are chosen. You are holy. You are blameless. You are adopted and you have been renamed. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You don't have to charge anything. But you do have to be strong. You need to put on the armor. And you need to stand your ground. And at the very end, he adds one more. And this is probably the most offensive part of it. He says, you need to pray. We're going to come to that at the end. And I, I cannot wait to talk about this with you and to talk through what that means and the implications. But one of the things that you're going to need to see about these four things, these four aspects of the battle that you're going to fight when you are fighting against the devil, when you are in a spiritual battle, is that you can't do this on Thursday and then check in a month later. There are three components I want you to hear about this. This has to be daily. This has to be deliberate, and this has to be disciplined. It has to be a part of who you are. The battle is coming. I realize I'm saying the battle is coming, and I know that for some of you, it is already here. And I want you to know something. You are not alone. Every one of us watching this knows what you're going through. We feel it too. So let me remind you of four things we're called to do. To be strong in the Lord. To put on the full armor of God and to stand our ground and to pray. So what does it look like to move forward with this? He's, look at it, what it says. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against what? The devil's schemes. And I want you to see this. Do you remember how the Japanese lulled the Americans into a quiet, peaceful Sunday morning? Sit down for peace talks while you launch 350 planes. The devil doesn't let you know he's coming. But I want you to know something. He's coming. So this is where we need to be. And this is where we need to understand. He has a scheme. He has a plan. And he does not let you know what it is. But then he goes on. And I think this may be one of the most critical things that you can hear. He explains it this way. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He goes on in 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God. Notice he says it again. Remember, whenever we are, whenever we are looking at the Bible, we always want to say, where is it repeating? It means it's important. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you, you will be able to what? Stand. And see there it is. Stand your ground. And then after you have done everything, to stand. Look at it echo throughout. Put on. Stand. But I want you to see something that may be the most critical thing that happens here. Whenever we think of spiritual warfare, we think of the devil. And whatever you think of the devil is probably something you saw when you were four or five years old on a cartoon. But let me tell you, there is one of his schemes that will be the most dangerous thing because it will impact everything else. You need to know who the real enemy is, and it is Satan himself. Watch what it says here, though. It explains who we are not fighting against. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So I, I want you to hear that. I don't know if you caught what I said. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That means that the people we have just studied for the last few weeks, they are not your enemy. The government is not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. Your children are not your enemy. Your parents are not your enemy. Your employer or your employee is not your enemy. And I'm going to go a little bit farther. Your president is not your enemy. Your governor is not your enemy. You have an enemy, and it is Satan. It is not a battle against flesh and blood. But here's the, one of the key schemes that he does. He says, look what that person said about you. Fight them. 
And so you and your child go at it. You and your employer go at it. You and your spouse go at it. Or you get on social media and you stir each other up going at all over the place, not realizing the enemy is not there. The enemy is the devil, and his scheme is to get you divided. I was talking with Pastor Ed, and he said in all of his life, he has never seen so much division. That is the current scheme the devil is using. Division in families, division in homes, divisions at work, divisions here. And I have to say that breaks my heart. I know that we have different perspectives on things, but it is heartbreaking to watch the way that we are responding to each other because of the nature of how we hope things would be, because of the normal that we miss, because of the direction we want to be going. And instead, we are fighting with ourselves. So I'd like you to press pause on the conflict. And we're going to actually stop and pray because I think this is a critical moment because you're fighting against each other. We are fighting against each other. And what we need desperately is to find out who the real enemy is. So let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts to see the truth that this is a spiritual battle and not a personal battle. God, I pray for every family. I pray for every father. I pray for every child. I pray for every wife. I pray for every employer and every employee. I pray for everyone that is serving in the government. I pray for everyone that is governed. Calm our hearts and help us to see that the enemy is not there. The enemy is Satan. And you are calling us to something precious in this time, something that's not divisive, something that's holy, something that refines us. Do a work in us, God. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to actually, in this middle of pausing, I want to challenge you with a couple questions that may help you evaluate if you are making the spiritual battle into something that's personal. See, these are some questions of, Whoever right now you have thought of as your enemy, which may be your employer, your neighbor, your government, your spouse, your father, your child. Question number one, am I weaponizing words? Sometimes the words we weaponize are the ones that Pastor Paul and Ed have said. Sometimes we weaponize the words that the government has said. Or sometimes, sadly, we take what the Bible says and we turn it into a weapon. And in the middle of conflict, we take it to bludgeon each other. Number one, am I weaponizing my words? Number two, am I willing to forgive? Am I willing to say, yes, the wound has come, but I will not hold it against you? I don't know that you're aware of this, but so many historical conflicts are built on the conflicts before. World War II was built on World War I because they did not process it properly. And you may very well take last week's fight and turn it into the conflict of today. And I don't know of any other way out. I don't know of any other way out other than forgiveness. As Jesus hung on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. I don't know that he gave another option. But forgiveness has to be a critical component. Next question really comes down into the heart. It's so critical. Am I taking this personally? And as someone is saying whatever they are saying to me, maybe they're hurting, and in the process of their hurting, they're saying something to me. Am I taking it in a personal way that then I will weaponize words and I will fight back? Or am I just willing to give grace? In fact, perhaps the only way to to handle this one, if forgiveness is the key to end last week's battle, perhaps the way to move forward when something personal comes at you is to offer grace, then maybe maybe they're having a hard time too. The next question I have is, am I judging someone when you're thinking of that enemy, that spouse or that father, that child, that employer? Am I judging them? If you are, then you're probably forgetting this, that they are chosen, that they are adopted, that they are named and that they are holy and that they are blameless. And if they are not, it's because they don't know Jesus. And if they don't know Jesus, you know what they need? They don't need you to judge them. They need Jesus. So let me ask you a simple question. Are you judging the person you're in conflict with? The second question, or the next question coming out of this, is how is my tone? Have you noticed you can say the exact same thing? And all you do is change the tone, and it changes everything. What are you doing? 
What are you doing? They're the exact same words. Yet the harm is profound when we do the secondary kind. When, with your tone, I want one of those things I notice is that this is often where escalation comes. And this is where the battle becomes a war. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. The next question I ask is, what's my response? And as I look at my response, I'm taken back to what Paul started with, Pastor Paul started with when he was reading the Apostle Paul at the beginning of the sermon series. He got two verses in, and he said that thing that has just stabbed at so many hearts. He said there are three critical components in how you will respond Here's what it, he says. He says, with all humility, with all gentleness, and with all patience. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. What is it that maintains unity? Humble, gentle, patient people. You know, I had an observation as I was just processing through these, this idea of being humble that I will put myself below other people. Gentleness, which says, I will try and say it the way that you need to have it heard. And patience, which I had never really thought of this, but I came across reading about this in another translation, different than the one that, that I do. Uh, the Bible is, is written in Hebrew and Greek, and then they, when they translate it into English, we have synonyms, so we can use a lot of different words to translate it into. And patience is probably the most common one, but in, in the New King James and in the Old King James Version, they use a phrase that just totally, I heard it and it rocked me. It's called long-suffering. Think about that. When you're asked to be patient, you're asked to suffer. And not just suffer for a moment, but suffer for a long time. And you know what I've noticed is when I'm willing to be long-suffering is the only moment when I can be gentle. Because when I'm not patient, I won't be gentle. I, it's amazing how much this response is locked into whether or not we have success inside these relationships. All the while, we think this is the spiritual battle that's happening. And it's not. The battle somewhere else. But I'll tell you what these relationships do. They reveal what's going on inside of our hearts and what's wrong. They reveal that there's a problem. There's another one of these that, that Paul came to about four weeks ago. The idea of am I submissive? Is my response submissive? Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for all that he has done. Submit to one another. So as your response, I want you to take those questions and evaluate them. Think through when I'm in conflict. Do I realize who the real enemy is? He goes on to give us what are the weapons that we need to use in response. This is what he says. Stand firm, by the way, if you're counting, that's number four. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What are the weapons that we need and why do we take them where we take them? An interesting little thought here. Remember how it says there's the devil's schemes? That means there's a certain way he's going to attack. God has perfectly situated us with the exact weapons needed to defend against what he will attack with. He didn't give us anything to guard our back. You know why? Because we ain't running. There's no need. But he knew exactly where to guard the rest. He knew how to guard the heart. He knew that the head and the mind matter. He knew that we needed a weapon as a sword. He knew that our feet had to be ready. But I want to ask you a question. What weapons are you taking into battle? share a little story with you. One of my personal heroes is Jim Elliott. This is Jim, Roger, Ed, Pete. Uh, all, of the, all of them were in their 20s. They all went down to Ecuador with a mission in mind. They heard about a group of people called the Wadani people. The local people there called them Alcas, which meant savages because they were so brutal. In fact, anthropomorphic People who are really well educated have said that they're one of the most dangerous homicidal people in the history of the world. And these five men had a passion to go lead them to Christ. And they found a way to do it. They had a beautiful little yellow airplane and they would fly around them. And they found a way that they could actually drop presents to the Wadani people. And they started to build connection. And then they found a place to land. They called it Palm Beach. And this is actually a picture of the plane. Landed at Palm Beach ready to make contact 
with those Wadani people. But as they got there, they made contact with uh, a man and two women and spent some time with them, connected with them. They actually took the, the man up in the airplane and flew him around. Can you imagine the, a Wadani person who has only ever lived in the bush getting in an airplane in 1958? Absolutely beautiful. Sorry, 1956. Well, three days later, the Wadani came to those five men, heavily armed, and attacked them and killed them. And what's so fascinating about this is that those five men martyred for their faith had a discussion before they left. And they asked this question, what weapons will we take with us? And their families asked, all of these guys were married. Many of them, four of them had children. Will we take guns to protect ourselves if the Wadani attack? And here was their response. No, we'll take the other weapons. We'll take the sword of the Spirit with us. And here was their mindset and here was their thinking. If we die, we're ready to see Jesus. If we have to raise a gun and shoot one of them, we are sending them to hell. So the weapon they walked in with was the sword of the Spirit, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. Their feet were fitted with the gospel of peace, but they made a decision, what weapons do we take with us? And what they took? Yeah, if you ask me, I think they took the right things, even though it cost them their lives. So as we look at this, I want you to know something. Choose the right weapons. Don't weaponize your words. Use the weapons that Jesus gives us. They're perfectly suited to stand against the devil's schemes. The first one I want to talk about is the belt of truth. Whenever you uh, hear sermons on this, this text is written in such an interesting way. He gives you a piece of physical armor, and then he has some spiritual component, and they attach them together. Every pastor that's ever preached on this is using a lot of inference. We're inferring on what we think these things mean. We're doing that again today. Just realize that that's true. In fact, you have probably heard other sermons. You may have heard other sermons about this. They will probably be a little bit different. It doesn't mean that they're wrong and I'm right or I'm right, they're wrong. It simply means we are looking at this saying, we know there's an armor and we know there's a spiritual aspect to it. And when I see a, a belt, I see something that holds us together, that holds, basically allows you movement Remember, we're picturing an armament that is related to 2,000 years ago. So think of every movie you've seen from Rome. That belt is critical because it holds everything together. And what I love about this is it says the belt of truth. Do you remember how we said we get the right weapons because the devil has schemes? Let me tell you, number one thing about the devil. The devil is a liar. And what does he offer us? A belt of truth. What is it that holds everything together? It's truth. And if truth isn't a component of your life, you're missing one of the great aspects of what God has offered us to fight against the devil's schemes. The next weapon I want you to notice is the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, I always think it's fascinating when you, when you kind of tear a word apart. The breastplate is the part that guards your heart. This is what guards your emotions. It guards you here. This is your critical area in a real battle. Uh, in a physical battle, when someone comes at you with a sword, if they hit metal here, I feel pretty good about my odds. If they take a sword to me right here and I don't have metal on, I'm feeling a little concerned. I love the beauty of this too, that, that it, it's covering the area that guards my heart. And I don't know that uh, the Apostle Paul put in this breastplate of righteousness saying, guard your heart. But I'm going to tell you this, you better guard your heart. So this idea of the breastplate of righteousness, you know what righteousness means? It means to be in right standing with God. Do you know how you get that? Jesus Christ gave his life for you dying on the cross, and then raising from the dead three days later. And when he rose from the dead three days later, he offers you the opportunity to accept him into your life. And when you do, it is the opportunity to, for you to move towards him. And here's what you'll be. You'll be chosen. You'll be holy. You'll be blameless. You'll be adopted. You'll be renamed. You will be sealed until the day of redemption. This changes everything. And so why can I put this on? Because Jesus Christ gave his life for me. It's everything we learned in chapters 1, 2, and 3. The next one that he gives us, gives us that offensive aspect, that part of movement that allows us to be a part of something beyond just us. He gives us shoes ready with the gospel of peace. The gospel actually means good news. You know what that is? It's the story I just told about Jesus who came from heaven came to earth, lived the perfect life, and then died, and three days later rose from the dead. That is the good news that we have the opportunity to take to people. And what a beautiful thing. When you put the shoes on, what it allows you to do 
was talking with a friend of mine uh, the other day, and we were talking about one of the, the prerequisites in one of the armies. Uh, and this is back when most people fought uh, without any shoes on. It was, they had hardened feet. They were ready to go. They were not soft like me and most of you. He, he made sure that they wore sandals. And he, here's what he realized. Remember that idea of stand firm? It's also your ability to move and that movement that comes. And when we have a mission like the gospel, uh, God gives us the weapon, the exact weapon we need. Matthew 28 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The next one after the, the shoes of the gospel of peace is a shield of faith. And it, it says something profound here. It's the only one that explains what happens in the battle. The belt, the shoes, breastplate, helmet, sword. He doesn't say anything about what you do with it. But the shield he talks about, and the shield he actually explains what is the devil's scheme coming at you. He says it can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. So a couple things you know. One, the devil's an archer. Two, he likes fire. He's a pyro. Okay? But here's what's funny. When I think of a shield from the Roman Empire, I don't think of something that can extinguish. In fact, I used to think of this, that they had, that this, this shield actually has little water bottles on the top four corners, and if, and if an arrow lands, it's on fire, it goes, and it will just put out the fire. I'm like, what on earth? How do they do this? And then with some historical background, um, most of their shields, they weren't metal. They were actually covered in leather. So what they would do is they would soak them in water, and now they're ready, which is an interesting thing. It adds weight but it also adds protection. It's going to be heavier to carry, but as they move forward, the arrow would fly. And I'm going to tell you something about spiritual warfare. It's not the arrow it creates, it's the fire it ignites. That's where the real danger is. This is exactly what happens in most of our thought lives. That a thought comes in. The thought is not what's damaging. It's that when we let it fester and the fire burns, and next thing you know, our minds are ravaged. But the shield of faith allows us to trust him Another thing that I, I want you to know, this is more historical, I'm inferring this, but I see it as a spiritual truth as well, is the shields within the Roman Empire, specifically the Roman Empire, they had a special ability, and this is one of the geniuses of why they were able to dominate for so long. Their military might was partly based on their ability to innovate, and they were able to put their shields into a formation that locked together, that allowed them to move forward, and it was basically impenetrable. If you picture this, this is actually, they called it a turtle because it, they created a shell. Here's what I want you to see. Picture that, and picture individuals coming running at them, trying to kill. You can't even see the men. This is a perfectly situated, uh, sit, a perfect situation for these men to protect themselves and to move forward in attack. It looks exactly to me like what you would think of as a tank. But I want you to see this and why I see a spiritual truth that connects with us. None of them are on their own. And let me ask you a question. Are you connected with people who are followers of Jesus where you have locked shields together and say, not today, Satan. Not only will we extinguish the flaming airs, I'm with him. I'm with her. Here we go and we march forward as, as God calls us to. The shield of faith not only extinguishes the, the flaming arrows, I believe it also is part of needed in community. And I realize that we're in a time right now where you are told social distance. That does not mean spiritual distance. You can have a great prayer time six feet apart. You can text some powerful words of wisdom and not be within that six feet bubble. Do not live socially, I mean spiritually isolated. Don't live socially isolated either. Just keep your six feet, all right? I actually got a shirt made that says six feet, please. Telling people to back up. Because when you go to the store, people are not, they don't honor that very well. The next thing that we want you to see on this is the helmet of salvation. What is it that guards your mind? Let's go back to that thing that puts us in right standing. It reminds us of grace. I am a sinner. I deserve hell. But Jesus Christ gave his life for me. That is what guards my mind. Because let me tell you what's going to come into my mind. Anger. Covetousness. Lies. How do I guard my mind? I guard it with the salvation that comes from the gift of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose from the dead three days later. Look for the pattern of your thoughts. In fact, I'd give one more caution on thoughts. I, I heard someone talk about this. I think it comes from Carolyn Leaf, and if it's not, and you love Carolyn Leaf, I'm sorry that I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure it's her. There's this idea that inside your mind, there's actual physiologically 
pathways that when you buy into a thought and continue in that same thought over and over and over again, here's what you will find, that those thoughts become easier and easier and easier, and it becomes the pattern of your life. And what's difficult is if the thought pattern is sinful, then we're going to continue in that, and it's very hard to break a habit of the mind. But it may be exactly where most spiritual battles are won and lost. And that leads me into the final weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. I actually have two swords with me today. I have the spiritual sword of the Spirit, and I also have a real sword. It is dull, so don't worry, I won't cut myself. But I was thinking about the nature of a sword, and the historian in me remembers many conversations about battles fought, Battles lost and battles won. And one of the arguments that you will find in history classes often is which weapon is the greatest of all time? And most of the time, this one wins. Do you know why? Because the sword is the only weapon in history that is both defensive and offensive. Let me show you something else. The sword of the Spirit is both defensive and offensive. Psalm 139, sorry, Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. That's a defensive mode. There's another one in Matthew 28 that we talked about earlier. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That is offensive. I am coming at you, Satan. We are here to win this battle. I'll tell you something. As we look at the armor of God and we talk through it, I want to share a perspective. And this is my perspective. This doesn't come from the elders or the other pastors. But if you ever find yourself transported back in time into a medieval fight and you only get to choose one weapon, choose the sword. It can defend you and you can attack with it. And if you happen to ever find yourself in a spiritual battle, choose the sword because it is both defensive and offensive. And you know what I find about the sword? It's where I find all the other armaments of God. Because that is where I find that there is a helmet of salvation and a breastplate of righteousness. This is where we find out all that really matters. But I want to go back to the last thing uh, that we see in this, in this text, and it's in verse 18. And I think it's where everything centers on and comes back to you. He says this, And pray in the Spirit. Let me read it again. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. He repeats it again for all the Lord's people. If you only have this one component, take the sword of the Spirit and pray on all occasions. We're actually going to practice this for a second. We're going to have a time of communion, and I want you to begin preparing your hearts. One of the aspects of of communion is that we have our hearts right with each other. And maybe you're in a place right now where you don't really feel like taking communion because you're going back to all those questions, and you're in the middle of a conflict, and your enemy, you don't think it's Satan, you think it's someone else. I want to pray over that. I want to pray over the battles that we've been fighting that haven't been spiritual but personal. Help us to take our eyes off of them. Put them back on Jesus and remember who the real enemy is. And pray for us. God, you call us to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And today, right now, we are crying out to you asking, God, I pray that you would break the division that is in our land, that is in our homes, that is in our church that you would bring the unity of the spirit that comes from humble, gentle, patient people, that you would grow us into that and help us to take our eyes off of each other and have our eyes on the real enemy, knowing that his schemes are lies and that we are chosen, that we are holy, that we are adopted, that we are blameless, that we are sealed until the day of redemption, that we have been renamed with your name. You're a good God and we trust you and our hope is in you and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that Christians do all over the world is that we celebrate and remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus through what we call communion. Sometimes it's called the Lord's Table, but it's something that unites us all together in Christ. And I want to read the passage that perhaps most clearly describes what we're doing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is correcting some ways in which they have been messing it up. They have been doing it wrong. And so he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So he makes a very simple statement. He, he takes what was part of the Passover meal. And we're using just a, a little sample here, but he took a piece of bread. And since it was part of the Passover meal, it would have been a piece of unleavened bread, which means it didn't have any yeast in it, which was a picture of the fact that Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. Yeast became a picture of sin in the, in the Old Testament. And so he took a little piece of bread and he said, I want you to take this, and interestingly enough, people all over the world, no matter what culture, no matter where they're from, they take some kind of bread. And people have bread from all kinds of different cultures. And so he took that little piece of bread and he said, this is my body for you. Now he was still standing there at the time. He, he hadn't died yet, but later they came to understand that his body was beaten and torn and he went through incredible torture part of him carrying the burden for sin. And he says, it's for you. So I want you to remember. When we have memorials, when we have things that we remember, it's to go back and to reappreciate, to remind ourselves of how important and how valuable. And this is a holy moment. And that's why we often start with examination of our hearts and confession. So you take that bread and you say, Lord, you did this for me. So we eat the bread. And then he said in the same way, he, he took the cup, which was one of the cups that was used in the Passover celebration, probably the cup of redemption. And he said, this is the new covenant. Now, the old agreement had been that people had to do sacrifices. They had to, to live under all kinds of laws. And there was this whole regimen, this whole process. That was the old covenant. And now he was saying, there's a new covenant. Those old sacrifices that you did at the temple, they're now replaced by Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. So it reminds us that we have forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. It reminds us that we now live in the new covenant where the Holy Spirit lives in us, where God is working in us and through us to, to make his kingdom here on earth. So he said, I want you to take that bread, I want you to take that cup, and I want you to do this in remembrance. Everything that's important we need to be reminded of because it's so easy for it to drop in. Not that we don't know it anymore, but it, it's not in the forefront of our mind. It's, yeah, I know that's true. And this elevates again who I am and that I belong to Jesus and what he's done for me. So as you are in your home, I hope that you have found some crackers or some juice or something. And maybe you don't have exactly the right elements, but the heart condition is what really matters. And I want you to get them together with your by yourself or with your family group. And I want you just to take a moment and I'm going to pray. And then we're going to eat and drink together. Father, thank you for the gift that was given. Thank you for Jesus, the perfect sacrifice lamb. Thank you for the pictures all the way through the Bible of how much you care about us and how much you love us, but how sin is a barrier that needs to be taken care of. God, we thank you for Jesus' body that was broken and his blood that was shed, for the life that was given and for the resurrection that shows, God, that the payment was accepted and that we can now be free in you. Lord, for everybody who's taking this, for every person who's remembering you, pray that you would draw them close, that you would help them to remember how important this is and to live their life out of a celebration of your death and resurrection for us. In the wonderful name of Jesus. If you need a little more time to uh, celebrate communion together wherever you are, uh, feel free to pause me. It may be the only time you're able to.
But I want to go back to the message we just listened to. What a great message and what a timely one. Um, there are spiritual battles all over. We feel it at the staff level, at the church level, in our culture. And so hopefully your heart is prepared as you have drawn close to the Lord. But let's go back to that discussion about what are those weapons and what is the armor that you need? And so the first question is, what's the, as Pastor Will walked through that, what were the things that you felt like, boy, I feel pretty comfortable with that. I, I feel like I do have that understanding of what the breastplate of righteousness is. I, I do feel I have the shoes on that are prepared. I, I do those more regularly and I am more comfortable with that. So first question that you go around and answer and then go back around the same group and ask the second question, which is the weapon that I need to practice with? And uh, as, as Will is handling that sword, I, I was thinking, you know, if I had a sword in my hand, I could, I could make it look good. But if somebody actually came at me with another sword, man, I do not know what to do with it. And uh, not only do we need to have the scriptures, but we need to be able to utilize them. And if you just say, somewhere in the Bible it says something about, that's not quite as effective. And so maybe it's the Bible, maybe you think there's one of the other pieces of armor that we talked about. You say, that's the one that as we were walking through this, the Holy Spirit said to me, that's the one you really need to focus on. So talk about the thing that you feel comfortable with, then talk about the weapon that you probably need to practice the most on. And I'm going to, again, we want this to be a discussion, whether you're in a watch party or whether you're in a family group or whether you're in a fellowship group. So if you're in a fellowship group, you're going to break up to groups of three or four and talk about this together. And so we will have the person who is closest to age 40, you're going to be the one that starts the discussion.